I'll turn over the stream on. So no spicy jokes, please. <laughs> Live. <laughs> no spinny jokes, no spicy jokes. <laughs> okay, now it's okay. Um, I guess I have to always mute it, otherwise we have this delay. Um, yeah, yeah, that angle looks much better, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> You can never get away with anything with me. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible person. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's too much fun. This is too much fun. Uh, let me share the screen. I, my official timer is my iPhone, so yeah. we'll pause it. Yeah. That's called uh, watch out. Uh, yeah, watch out in. in Move by, sir. It's, it's watch out in, in very dialect the German. <laughs> <Of course. Okay. laughs> uh, I try to learn the best I can, which is not very good. Uh, uh, it's okay. The, your Pelzisch experience. Exactly, exactly. I, 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 you know, my high Deutsch is not very high. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that gives you credit here. Exactly, exactly. I think so too. That's no problem. Yeah, it's so funny. Everybody just last minute. But they all know that I also talk for a few seconds. So. And typically, the, so this will go on, of course, on the online, on the YouTube, and then uh, it usually gets watched like 500, 600 times afterwards. So. Um, alrighty, uh, good. Uh, I would like to welcome everybody once again to the SPICE SPIN Plus X seminars uh, that we run here from the SPICE uh, Phenomena Interdisciplinary Center myself and uh, Karen Everso City, which is now in Duisburg, uh, together with the Collaborative Research Center SPIN Plus X, that is led by Martina Schliemann, um, Burkhard Hillebrands in uh, Kaiserslautern, and Matthias Chloe in the Mainz. This is a Zoom webinar, meaning that you will see the speaker as usual, and then you can ask your Q&A, uh, write them please on the questions in the Q&A, and I will give you the floor by either raising your hand or just writing a question there, uh, and then please uh, go back, just follow that procedure. Um, next week, we have Katerina Frank giving the talk. And then afterwards, for the next two weeks in July, we may have two talks in July. We may have just, uh, just remain with only two talks and we'll take a break in August. And we'll try to continue uh, later on in, um, in September. And I will announce that also next, uh, next talk as well. Uh, today, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Vincent Baltz, a good colleague and uh, we're collaborating with uh, from CNRS. Uh, uh, he obtained his PhD in 2005 uh, in the University of Grenoble in France and liked it so much that he stayed there. Afterwards, mm -hmm. uh, after that, his habilitation. Uh, so he's, he's, a, he's a mountain man. Um, sure, uh, yeah. But he's also very well known uh, for his uh, all his contribution in magnetism, as independent phenomena, uh, and also has been leading a lot of the physics on antiferromagnetic spintronics, uh, and it has been a pleasure to collaborate with him over the, this uh, few years and, and uh, discovering many new things in these new areas. Um, so with that, um, I will ask uh, to please go ahead and share your screen, Vincent. Okay, uh, thank you, Hi. Start the discussion whenever you like, or the, the presentation whenever you like. Okay. Can you see, can you see that? Uh, it's coming up, so so far I don't see, but I think uh, it takes a few seconds maybe. Yeah, now we can see it. We can, okay, okay, excellent. Okay, so uh, I will start. First of all, I would like to, to thank you, Jairo, uh, and all the organizers uh, for your kind invitation to give a seminar in the frame of this uh, SPICE uh, SPIN plus X uh, series. And uh, today I will talk about um, spin and charge transport in antiferromagnets and also in ferromagnets. And before that, I would first like to acknowledge the hard work of uh, Rafael lopez Siger, of Mina Leviska and Floris van Duin, uh, who uh, took over from their predecessors, Pablo Merodio, Lamprini Frangou, Olga Gladi, and Guillaume Forestier. Can you, Go ahead. Can you hear me? As I've got the yeah, problem, it's, it's not slightly, it's slightly delayed on the thing, but I think it's okay now. 
Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm just trying to change slide, but it's not working. Yeah, it's working. Okay. I think it's a slightly slow, but let's go ahead and. All right, let's try if it works. Yeah. So moving on to this slide. So I'll, I'll, here's the outline of the talk. So in the first part, I'll quickly present the lab and give more insight on the research of antifematic spintronics uh, in the lab. And in the next part, I will present some findings on four different topics. I'll talk about spin transport to reveal antifematic properties. Then I will talk about the self-induced spin charge conversion, about Cooper pair transport to reveal antiferromagnets, and about the replication of spin textures in antiferromagnets. So we are located in Grenoble, in the southeast of France, uh, and we are in the heart of, uh, of the French Alps. And the laboratory is part of a huge scientific campus that hosts, uh, uh, I would say, a very dynamic ecosystem for higher education, training, research, and innovation. And in this slide, I would just like to mention very briefly that SpinTech currently hosts uh, about 100 persons uh, who carry out both fundamental and uh, applied uh, research in diverse areas of spintronics, uh, which are uh, all uh, listed here. And this work is done in collaboration with academic and industrial partners, including some of the spin-off uh, companies which were launched from the lab. So as you see here, research is organized in uh, groups and support to research. And in practice, work is performed cooperatively uh, in a very flexible manner. And today, I will talk about some of the work that uh, we do on antiferromagnetic spintronics. So there has been quite some review literature on antiferromagnetic spintronics. And what I'd like to show in the next slide uh, is the type of study we carry out in the lab in this uh, general context. So we are interested in the specificities inherent to antiferromagnetic materials. And I'd say that the presence of two spin sublattices gives them two degrees of freedom. One is related to the net magnetization and is expressed uh, macroscopically in a direct way. And the other is more local and it uh, relates to the nail vector and it is expressed macroscopically in a very uh, uh, indirect way. And I'd say that this is why uh, the physics of antiferromagnets is very rich and sometimes very unexpected. So the aim of the work we pursue and that we've done and that we do is to explore the device, the different facets of these specificities, both from the point of view of uh, interface nanomagnetism, dynamics of the antiferromagnetic order, and electronic transport. And in this presentation, I have decided to focus on electronic transport based on spin dependent scattering whether the transport be of magnonic or electronic nature, Cooper pair transport included. I will also present some results on spin textures in antiferromagnets. And at the very end, I will say a few words about the uh, other two activities. So let's now talk about spin transport to reveal antiferromagnetic properties. So for this activity, we used the uh, spin pumping uh, method to reveal uh, the transport properties of antiferromagnets. And we've used that because uh, it, it's a method that overcomes the obstacle related to the difficulty of measuring uh, these materials when they lack global magnetization. So you, you, you probably know it already, but I will recall the principle very quickly. It's the following, the spin accumulation linked to uh, the dynamic uh, magnetization uh, or dynamic excitation of an adjacent ferromagnet generates uh, by diffusion a spin current and a loss of angular momentum, um, which is formalized by the parameter G, which is the spin mixing conductance, and which is linked to the transport in the antiferro and which impacts the relaxation of the ferromagnet. So by measuring the relaxation of the ferromagnet, we can trace uh, transport properties in the antiferromagnet. We have access to spin filtering, to spin diffusion lengths, and so on and so forth. And if we now measure the transverse potential drop, we can trace the spin orbit properties in the antiferromagnet. So I would say that this type of work that we have pursued, but that many others pursued uh, all over the world, has opened perspectives for the study of spin transport 
uh, in antiferromagnets, both in the electronic and magnetic regime. So in practice, we used uh, a three-loop, two-gap resonator, which is shown uh, here, operating at 9.6 gigahertz, uh, at a viable input power, viable temperature, viable amplitude and angle for the, the bias magnetic field. And uh, uh, here is a typical absorption uh, spectrum that we can get. So we use lock-in detection uh, to enhance signal-to-noise ratio. And data are fitted with uh, the differential of a Lorentzian uh, to determine the peak-to-peak uh, -peak line widths and the uh, resonance field. And the part of the angular momentum here, which is uh, lost by the ferromagnet and transferred to the antiferromagnet, can be extracted from the line widths. At this point, I want to uh, uh, mention that extra line widths can be produced uh, by uh, some uh, other uh, mechanisms, so by the antiferromagnet, but also by other mechanisms uh, like, like two magnon scattering or, or the inhomogeneous properties of the film, which is formulated here by this delta H uh, naught. And uh, I, I, I will mention that specific data such as angular uh, scans, viable frequency scans, were taken so as to make sure that the signal we obtain relates to the antiferromagnetic spin sink. So in the following, I decided to focus on the physics and to skip these uh, technical parts. Uh, and uh, I will use the denomination alpha p or spin absorption for the absorption by the antiferromagnet. Concerning the electrical signal, uh, here is a typical voltage versus field spectrum that can be measured simultaneously. And uh, the symmetric uh, here and the anti-symmetric contributions were disentangled by fitting the data using uh, this type of equation. And again, uh, in the same way as before, uh, the symmetric contribution can be produced by the inverse spin hole effect but combined with, for example, anisotropic magnetoresistance effects or, or, or related planar hole effect or the anomalous Nernst effect. And similarly, I would say that specific data like angular scans, viable interfaces, viable sicknesses, et cetera, were taken in the data I will show so as to make sure that the signal we obtained are related to the inverse spin hole effect, which uh, I will focus on in, uh, in, in a few couple of slides. So based on this type of measurements, uh, we demonstrated a spin uh, pumping effect linked to the fluctuations of the order parameter close to the nail temperature. And this confirmed some theoretical predictions that directly linked the linear susceptibility, chi zero, to the spin mixing conductance. So in other words, to the antiferromagnet's spin absorption. So for example, the, the antiferromagnetic spin absorption shown in, uh, in blue in this graph is uh, in fact a direct signature of the linear susceptibility of the antiferromagnet with the expecting maximum near the magnetic transition temperature. What is important to note here is that J is an interfacial property. And that's why this type of work opened up perspectives for the study of transitions at low sicknesses, which are difficult to access by existing volume techniques. Uh, so next, I will detail two examples of such studies, and then I'll move on to uh, uh, other types of, uh, of studies. So here on the left, I first discuss results on a nickel ion ferromagnet that is in direct contact with a nickel iron oxide insulating antiferromagnet. And in this type of B-layer, uh, the um, uh, transfer and propagation of spin angular momentum, I would say involves magnons from the oscillating ferromagnet feeding into the uh, antiferromagnet due to the fact that the, uh, the, the two layers are directly coupled. And the end result is, uh, as you see here, an overall enhancement of the signal of the spin pumping near the phase transition of this uh, nickel iron oxide antiferromagnetic layer. Interestingly, in this type of graph, uh, the effect is suppressed when copper is added in between the ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet. 
And in fact, copper breaks the direct magnetic interaction between the ferromagnet and the antiferromagnet. So in this case, uh, the spin transport is mediated by a purely electronic transport regime through copper, and no magnetic transport is allowed. So the, the, the spin diffusion length of, for copper is much longer than three nanometers, which was the thickness of this copper layer. So propagation I mean, the, of the electronic transport will not be altered in copper. Uh, uh, but however, uh, these data show that virtually no spin angular momentum is transmitted to the uh, nickel iron oxide at this uh, interface. So similarly, for a completely metallic stack, we could also disentangle the electronic and magnetic transport related to spin sinking in an iridium manganese uh, layer. And we compared two series of samples. So on the top here, I show one where there is a copper spacer between a nickel ion injector and an iridium manganese spin sink. And in that case, electronic transport occurs or prevails. And in the bottom here, uh, I'm showing the case in which uh, there is no copper spacer. So there is a direct coupling between the nickel ion layer and the iridium mang manganese layer. And in this case, magnetic transport takes place. So if we look at the amplitude of the signal, the plot of the iridium manganese thickness dependence of the enhanced amplitude, alpha, delta, alpha, p here, uh, it shows a clear difference between the two transport regime. Uh, in blue here, we see that it is independent on the thickness of the iridium manganese layer in the uh, uh, magnetic regime, uh, in, and, uh, and uh, it, is, uh, uh, it scales as one over the thickness in the electronic regime uh, in line with theoretical predictions. So this result is actually a direct consequence of the fact that we have a deeper penetration of spin current when it's carried by magnons compared to that transported by conduction electrons. So if we now we have a look at the position of the peak, we see that it is independent on the magnetic and electronic uh, nature of the transport. So if we look at the blue curve here, we see that the peak is at around 60 Kelvin, which is similar to the blue curve here on the top. So for the same thickness, but when there is a direct coupling or no direct coupling. And the fact that the position of the peak stays the same, independent on the probe, um, is uh, uh, agrees, I would say, with the hypothesis that the peak can be used as an indicator of the ordering transition temperature, which is specific to the iridium manganese antiferromagnet here, whether the probe be of magnetic or electronic nature. As to the thickness dependence of the transition, it agrees with scaling models. Uh, here is an example for nickel oxide with data from the literature and data from, from some of our results. And basically, uh, the general idea is that the number of spin coordination reduces for thinner layers, which results in the loss of nail temperature for, for thinner layers. Uh, in this slide, I will be quite quick, but I just want to insist on the fact that the findings from the spin pumping technique relies on an interferon property. And uh, that is why it has opened the perspective for the study of transitions at low temperature. And similar to other transport-related measurements, such as the spin hole magnetoresistance. resistance If we look at the graph um, uh, below two nanometers, it's some of the newest uh, techniques that rely on interferon properties that gave this type of, um, of, uh, of data points. So up to now, I have shown some results uh, related to linear fluctuations to chi zero. And what about nonlinear fluctuations related to higher order terms in magnetic fields? So here at the bottom, um, uh, uh, I'm showing an illustration to say that theoretical models of the literature and some experimental results in non-local geometry predict uh, that spin charge conversion effect relate to the second order uh, uh, nonlinear contribution 
of uh, the, the, the spin fluctuations, this chi 2. And this happens in the broader uh, context of spin uh, correlations related to exchange and to uh, spin orbit uh, uh, interactions. So here in green, I'm showing a curve where uh, after uh, uh, an, an quite a number of efforts to optimize the stacks, uh, we are very close to sorting the electrical spin charge conversion related to those nonlinear fluctuations. Uh, that's this little uh, uh, tilted uh, signal that we see here and that we believe relates to what uh, uh, we think is uh, the uh, chi 2 or signature of chi 2 We still have some work to do in order to be sure that, that what we are observing really relates to chi 2 uh, So I'm not going to say more on that today. Um, what I want to show next is uh, I want to discuss this curve here in uh, red for a bare nickel ion, uh, which is an overlooked effect and which we demonstrated on the course of the exploration of nonlinear fluctuations. So the overlooked effect is uh, the self-induced spin hole effect, which superimposes, as we see here, to the signal we wanted to probe. So I will now talk about uh, self-induced spin charge conversion in ferromagnets. And coming back to these uh, nickel ion iridium manganese B layers, uh, here on the top, we observe a voltage signal and let's just focus at 300 Kelvin first. Uh, this signal increases when we increase the thickness of the iridium manganese layer. And this is this agrees, I mean, with, with typical models for the inverse spin hole effect in uh, iridium manganese. And we can conclude that here at 300 Kelvin, the spin charge conversion occurs mainly in the iridium manganese layer. What is more puzzling, or what was more puzzling, is that we could observe a large signal at low temperature. And the position of this signal is independent on the thickness of the iridium manganese layer. And this disagrees with the expectation from the absorption data that I've shown earlier. Because remember, finite size effects make any iridium manganese related peak thickness dependent. So after retro engineering the stacks and conducting measurements with several interfaces, several thicknesses, several sweep rate dynamics, angular dependence, etc. we could clearly conclude that this non-monotonic behavior is inherent to spin charge conversion in the nickel ion layer. And actually self-induced uh, charge uh, 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 current can be considered to occur uh, through distinct mechanisms. So for example, here on the left, it can occur through a mechanism which is called magnetic charge pumping. And here on the right, it can occur through a mechanism, as a usual uh, mechanism called the inverse spin hole effect. Huh? Uh, I want to mention that while both mechanisms are triggered by spin orbit interaction in ferromagnets, they are fundamentally different. Uh, magnetic charge pumping is dictated by uh, the lack of spatial inversion symmetry. And the inverse spin hole effect uh, includes spin dependent transverse scattering subsequent to uh, spin current generation due to asymmetric scattering at the interfaces. In some of the earlier works from the literature, data indicated uh, a conversion efficiency of about 1% for nickel ion at room temperature. So in this slide, I'm not showing all the data which drove us to these uh, uh, findings. You can find all the details, for example, in this paper. But I want to compare our temperature dependent experimental data on a bare nickel ion film, like in here, with a non-monotonic temperature dependence of spin charge conversion. And I want to compare that to first principle calculations for the inverse spin hole effect, which is shown here on the right-hand side which was made by uh, our theoretician collaborators. Uh, in this series, thermal effects were modeled by considering electron scattering due to lattice vibration. And the temperature dependence of the transverse spin hole conductivity 
is here, as we see, in satisfactory, uh, at least qualitatively, agreement with the experimental findings. Here on the right, uh, we wanted to gain more insight on the origin of this non-monotonic behavior. Uh, and to do that, we disentangled the uh, skew scattering contribution, which is plotted here in blue, from the side jump plus intrinsic contribution, plotted here in uh, green, uh, by uh, using an approach uh, based on the scaling behavior. And we see here clearly that the non-monotonic temperature dependence is due to the fact that we have uh, two effects with similar amplitudes but opposite, uh, opposite trends. What I want to, to, to point out uh, to finish with this uh, slide uh, is that these results, they further indicated that the uh, self-induced conversion within uh, ferromagnets, so here nickel ion, they can be as efficient as that of platinum uh, here. Uh, and thus that needs to be carefully considered when investigating uh, the temperature dependence of spin orbit related effects in materials designed for, for, for use in spintronics. So I've talked about um, some uh, um, uh, types of uh, electronic transport or, or spin transport in antiferromagnets. And now I would like to extend this type of studies to uh, a Cooper pair transport. So in the next part, I will uh, come back to antiferromagnets and I will say a few words about the use of Cooper pair transport to probe antiferromagnets properties. So before that, let me first describe the principle of the measurements that we've made, and which is based uh, on a well-known proximity effect between a ferromagnet and a superconductor. So basically, Cooper pairs, they consist of electrons of opposite spins, and they experience the short-range direct exchange field of a saturated uh, ferromagnet. And this phenomenon uh, reduces the critical temperature of the superconductor compared to the case where we have a bare superconductor. And if now uh, the ferromagnet is set in a multi-domain configuration, a magnetic domain wall flanked on, uh, 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 by opposite spins will reduce the average exchange field, and thus it allows a partial recovery of the superconducting critical temperature. So this partial recovery is called here delta Tc. Observation of the actual temperature enhancement due to proximity effect near a ferromagnetic domain wall is very difficult because it involves a, a, a broad set of parameters which must be adjusted one uh, with respect to each other. For example, the, uh, the parameters at stake are the superconducting co coherence lengths versus the layer thickness versus the domains and the domain wall sizes. Uh, I can give a, a very intuitive um, uh, picture. If the uh, domain size is much larger than the size of the superconducting coherence lengths, on average, your Cooper pair will sense a saturated ferromagnet. So even if you have a multi-domain ferromagnet, you can't probe the partial recovery delta Tc because in either case, whether it's saturated or multi-domain, you always probe on average a saturated uh, ferromagnet. And so that's the type of optimization that needs to be done in order to get a large delta Tc. To date in the literature, only a small recovery of about 0.6% was reported. So I'm showing here data from this uh, paper from the group of uh, Professor Chen. Uh, you see that if you put your ferromagnet in a multi-domain state, your TC is larger compared to the case where you put your ferromagnet in a single domain uh, state. And because the maximum recovery is small, uh, between the fully demagnetized and the fully saturated state, but that prevents the investigation of, uh, of some uh, uh, types of physics, 
like the uh, intermediate main tick configuration. So it's impossible to sort any of the intermediate configurations. And it also prevents investigations of inserting an interlayer, uh, like for example, anti fur magnets and see how uh, Cooper pairs can penetrate uh, inside the anti fur magnet. So here, uh, the first step uh, uh, that, that we wanted to do or that we had to do was to optimize all the parameters in order to maximize the recovery as best as possible. So we measured the superconducting critical temperature of a niobium uh, nitride uh, um, superconductor. And it was determined from the temperature dependent measurements of the stacks resistance based on a simple longitudinal uh, uh, resistance uh, measurement between two contacts. Uh, the transversal contacts here, they were used to monitor the hysteresis loop of the uh, platinum cobalt multilayer, which was used as a ferromagnet through the anomalous hole effect. Uh, and minor loops uh, are shown, a uh, minor loop is shown here. And it was used to reach a saturated state here in blue and a demagnetized state. And through varying the layers, thicknesses, and the magnetic properties, such as the perpendicular and isotropy, we obtained here a tenfold improvement of recovery uh, compared to literature. Uh, you see here in uh, red the curve for a demagnetized state, and in blue the curve for a saturated state, and we have a recovery of around 700 millikelvin compared to a TC of around 7 Kelvin. And the fact that the recovery is large, it opened the way for novel experimental and theoretical investigations. So in particular, we studied the impact of a gradual change of the ferromagnetic state from a multi-domain uh, state here on this side when M is equal to zero to a saturated state when uh, uh, M over MS is equal to, uh, to one. And we could corroborate uh, these experimental results by a quasi-classical uh, diffusive model based, uh, made by our uh, theoretician collaborators. Inter interestingly for, for, for this talk, uh, by adding uh, an anti magnet in between the ferromagnet and the superconductor, we were able to probe the penetration depths of Cooper pairs in anti magnets with the example here of the iridium manganese anti magnet, where we find a coherence length of the order of uh, seven nanometers, and that relates to the depairing of Cooper pairs in the iridium anti magnet. So to say a few more words about this type of graph, so basically here, every point corresponds to one thickness of the anti magnet and was obtained by a self-consistent measurement, so to say, where we uh, saturate the ferromagnet, uh, we measure the TC, we demagnetize the ferromagnet, we measure the TC, and we can conclude on the delta TC over TC. So I will now move on to the last part of my talk today. Uh, I've talked about uh, uh, transport, and in this last part, I will talk about uh, um, uh, a work which is more related to magnetism, uh, but with the aim to do some transport and to reveal some transport properties of uh, antimagnetic spin textures. So um, the, the idea here is to search for a mean to create spin textures in uh, antimagnetic materials, in actual antimagnetic materials, um, with the further aim uh, to study transport uh, related to those spin textures. So why uh, do we want to, to do so? Uh, well, because spin textures uh, in actual anti magnets have been predicted to show key advantages over their uh, ferromagnetic analogs. Uh, so I listed here uh, some of these advantages for, for, for three types of, uh, of textures. Uh, so, for example, in terms of, of um, uh, domain walls, it was predicted that it's possible to have ultra-fast dynamics, which is not limited by the Walker breakdown. Um, as far as vortex are considered, it's possible to evidence new type of uh, textures. And for skiamions, then, 
it, it would be possible to have a straight trajectory due to a uh, compensation of this Kamian Hall effect. But the bottleneck uh, in this type of studies is uh, related to the creation of the spin textures, how to create these spin textures uh, in uh, uh, thin films of antiferro magnets. So I will first start by uh, showing a way to manipulate the order parameter of an antiferro magnet. Uh, and this way is to take advantage of the strong exchange bias coupling between the antiferromagnet magnet and an ad adjacent uh, um, ferromagnet, like a platinum cobalt uh, multilayer ferromagnet, to imprint a ferromagnetic configuration in the antiferromagnet. magnet. So in a first step, uh, exchange bias interaction is quenched by raising the temperature above the blocking temperature of the ferromagnet antiferromagnet magnet layer And in that case, the antiferromagnet magnet loses its ability to pin the uh, ferromagnetic layer. So the, uh, the uh, adjacent ferromagnet, it, it can then be considered as a, um, I would say, uh, a single layer in which it is possible to nucleate different types of configurations by conventional means. So here I'm taking the example of a saturated state. So in the second state, when we have saturated the ferromagnets, the bilayer is cooled below the blocking temperature. And that causes the moments in the antiferromagnet to align due to exchange bias coupling. So it is said that the configuration in the ferromagnet is replicated in the antiferromagnet. And below the blocking temperature, the moments in the antiferromagnet, uh, as sketched in here, they remain pinned regardless of the direction of the moments in the ferromagnet. And due to that, uh, when sweeping the magnetic field, uh, the configuration when the moments of the ferromagnet are aligned with those of the antiferromagnet is energetically more uh, favorable compared to the opposite configurations. And as a result, the loop shift is shifted to uh, here to, to towards negative fields. Now that's usual exchange bias. If now the moments in the ferromagnet before cooling are saturated towards the opposite uh, direction, uh, then the antiferromagnet is spinned towards the opposite direction and the loop is shifted towards the opposite direction. So here towards the positive field. And if now, for example, the ferromagnet is demagnetized during the heating cooling process, then it becomes possible to replicate a multi-domain state in the antiferromagnet. And the signature of such a multi-domain state uh, is shown uh, here. And these, these data points are, are actual experimental data points. Um, and it's clear from the experiment that here we have a double shifted hysteresis loops, meaning that half of the antiferromagnet pins the ferromagnet towards a positive direction and the other half pins the ferromagnet towards the negative direction. And it's actually possible to directly image this multi-domain configuration in the antiferromagnet and uh, by, for example, using a nitrogen vacancy magnetometry. And these are preliminary uh, results where we think that we are observing the uh, stray field of the demagnetized iridium manganese layer. Uh, this type of image was obtained in collaboration with uh, the group of Vincent Jacques in uh, Montpellier. So back to our spin textures. We now know that we can replicate uh, a demagnetized state, so multi-domain state. Um, and what if uh, uh, this heating cooling procedure is used to imprint uh, other types of textures? So for example, we could think of patterning some dots uh, where a uh, vortex is stabilized in zero field. And then we could uh, go over the whole procedure and imprint this vortex configuration in the antiferromagnet. Uh, so this is actually what is shown here in our data uh, here on the, on the left. Uh, so they show uh, here uh, the results of uh, circular decruism. Uh, so here at the iron edge, so where uh, that's, that's the, 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 the vortex, uh, the, the observation of a curling vortex in a nickel iron ferromagnet. And at the manganese edge, we see that this curling vortex has been replicated uh, at least at the interface of the iridium manganese uh, layer. And here's a, the, the, the signal here huh, was produced by uncompensated moments 
at the iridium manganese interface. I'm show showing here on the, on the right hand side uh, some other data uh, which were done by another group. Uh, and you could, uh, they could observe a, so a curling vortex and also a divergent vortex for nickel oxide and cobalt oxide disks. Uh, and they measured that with linear decreasism, and they could conclude that the vortex uh, extended across the whole thickness of their layers, uh, which were of uh, three nanometers thick. So in the next slide, uh, I will show how we want to take advantage of this type of approach to create uh, bubbles or ideally skirmions in an antiferromagnet. So what if here we stabilize uh, uh, skirmions or bubbles or this type of textures, and then we try to imprint by using the same uh, heating and cooling procedure. Uh, let me first mention that this is a collaboration between uh, the uh, uh, antiphonetic spintronics uh, team and the, the skiamion uh, teams of Olivier Boulle at Spintech, uh, also a collaboration with, uh, with ALBA. Uh, and firstly, on the left hand side, I'm showing the stack, which also required a lot of optimization. Um, so we'll give some examples. So the, the, the nickel ion thickness was chosen in order to allow the formation of, uh, of skiamions in the ferromagnet. Uh, in addition to that, we added a, a thin cobalt platinum melt layer uh, to provide a large perpendicular magnetic anisotropy as well as, as, well as a large uh, Jelsinski-Moria uh, interaction. Uh, and the idea was to have a thin layer uh, which could not decouple uh, the, the uh, uh, direct exchange bias between iridium manganese and the nickel ion uh, layer here. Uh, there were other types of optimizations. For example, the stacking order was uh, used in such a way that it's favorable for this type of, uh, of experiment, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm not showing the results uh, of, of the MOOC uh, data, as it can be found in, the, in this paper, but the MOOC data confirmed that indeed we have exchange bias because we have a loop shift. Uh, we also conducted some uh, uh, BUN light scattering measurements, or these measurements were conducted by some collaborators in Paris. And these data also confirmed that uh, the value of the DMI parameter is in line with uh, the preferred formation of left handed. Uh, nail walls and skirmions in the ferromagnet. So in the ferromagnet, we can do some XMCD PIM uh, measurements at the ion uh, L edge. Um, and with this, uh, we uh, 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 see that we have some uh, spin textures, uh, bubbles or skirmions. We don't have sufficient resolution to be uh, sure about the exact uh, morphology of the system, but uh, um, these data and simulations point to the likely formation of skirmions in this type of, uh, of uh, ferromagnet. And now we can use the uh, cooling procedure and see whether we can imprint anything uh, in the uh, anti-ferromagnet. So here are the uh, results. Uh, at the manganese edge of the XMCD PIM uh, data, and they provide information on the non-compensated manganese spins at the top interface of the iridium manganese uh, layer. If we look at the graph or at the uh, um, uh, data on the right-hand side, we see that for some regions, those which are uh, uh, in green, circled in, in, in green, uh, spin textures are clearly observed and their shape and their position coincide with the uh, uh, textures in the nickel and ferromagnet. So these results demonstrate that some spin textures can clearly be uh, uh, replicated uh, in the interfacial manganese uh, spins of the iridium uh, antiferromagnet. Uh, to be specific, we cannot conclude from this data that the texture uh, extended over the whole thickness of the iridium manganese layer, but there are some hints in the literature saying that it is possible to, uh, um, I would say, to, uh, uh, to, to, to uh, replicate uh, some uh, textures or some, some spring uh, uh, magnets 
from one side of the antiferromagnet to the other side of the iridium and antiferromagnet when the thickness is of the order of, uh, of three to five nanometers, like in here. I also want to point out uh, from the figure on the right that uh, we can also observe that the con con uh, conformity is not uh, uh, good uh, in, in this whole uh, area. Uh, and for some areas, textures in the nickel ion were not replicated in the iridium manganese layer. And these results, we think they can be accounted for the known spatial distribution of the blocking temperature, which is shown here on the top left panel. So this top left panel simply tells us that above 300 Kelvin, some of the antiferromagnetic entities will be pinned and below some of them will have a, a TB which is too small. So at 300 Kelvin, they will never be uh, pinned. Uh, so that's what is written here basically uh, for uh, areas where the blocking temperature is above 300 uh, uh, Kelvin, the magnetic configuration of the nickel ion layer can be stabilized in the antiferromagnet at 300 Kelvin. Whereas for the areas where the blocking temperature is below 300 Kelvin, these textures cannot be stabilized at 300 Kelvin in the antiferromagnet. Uh, we would need to go down to a much lower temperature to stabilize or to replicate these type of, um, of areas. Um, here, uh, I want to also mention that beyond the interest in uh, replicating a spin texture in an antiferromagnet from a purely exchange bias point of view, uh, this type of study, um, uh, I mean, uh, could open perspectives because each, there, there were up to date some insights on the spatial distribution of the blocking temperature. But here, this type of observation, they would provide a direct observation of the spatial distribution of this blocking temperature. So uh, I come to the conclusion, um, and to conclude, so I summarize the themes that we pursue in the lab on antiphromatic spintronics. So part of which I presented today on the stabilization here of spin textures in antiferromagnets in search of the study of the spintronics effects associated. Uh, something that I have not discussed today uh, relates to dynamics of the order parameter. So I will just mention here that uh, we pursue this study in collaboration with the High Magnetic Field Lab um, in Grenoble, uh, in collaboration with Anlor uh, Barra. And what we have at the moment is we have upgraded an existing experimental uh, bench to understand how subterrace antiferromagnetic dynamics can promote spin pumping with what efficiency especially with respect to the damping parameter and to uh, the uh, ability of the antiferromagnet to, uh, um, uh, to transfer uh, angular momentum. Uh, that is related to uh, those two works which were published uh, last year. And I will be happy to answer any questions if you have any questions on, on this topic as well. Um, I've talked also today on spin and charge transport, whether the transport be of magnonic, of single electron and of Cooper per nature. And we work on uh, different types of transport. Uh, here, uh, as I've talked today, when the transport mechanism relates to defect scattering, but we also have an activity uh, uh, on the uh, effects which are intrinsic to the spin symmetry group, as shown here in the bottom right. And I would say a few words on this uh, specific topic. Um, and I would like to, to mention that we have an open position on this topic. And the candidates uh, will work in the frame of a collaborative project between Mainz, uh, Prague, Marseille, uh, Grenoble, Dresden, and Constance. Um, and maybe a few words about the project huh, before I conclude. Uh, I will take probably one or two minutes about that. Um, so basically, the project is based on uh, the demonstration of a large spontaneous hall effect in the manganese 5 silicon 3 collinear and coplanar antiferromagnet. And we think that this is due to a novel time reversal symmetry breaking mechanism with uh, staggered spin splitting. And what is interesting uh, about this effect 
is that it is compatible with low atomic numbers, with collinear magnetism, uh, with weak spin decoherence, and with a vanishing net magnetization uh, like in uh, anti magnets. So to say a few more, to be more specific, uh, the experiments here, they show a Hall effect as large as 20 Siemens per centimeter in an epitaxial film of the manganese 5 silicon 3 collinear and coplanar anti magnet. There are some additional magnetometry, uh, temperature dependent measurements and crystal quality dependent measurements. And all these data, they pointed to the importance of the crystallography. And what uh, calculations by, uh, uh, by these guys that you know uh, pretty well um, uh, gave, uh, is that these calculations, they further pointed to the importance of the spin symmetry. So when uh, uh, rel uh, relativistic uh, physics uh, is uh, uh, waived. Uh, and to make a long story short, uh, theory predicts intrinsic effects in some specific spin symmetry, symmetry group that break the time reversal symmetry. And manganese 5 silicon 3 belongs to this new class of materials. And its energy dispersion is shown uh, here. I mean, the calculations are shown here. And they show a staggered spin splitting. And this is at the origin of a non-zero Berry curvature and hence of a non-zero Hall effect when uh, spin orbit interactions are turned on. But spin orbit interaction needs to be turned on in order to, to, to evidence the effect by the, 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 the charge Hall effect. But they are not at the origin of, uh, the, the, of the effect. No? And the magnitudes from the calculations, they agree with uh, the calculations. So I am sure that you will have uh, other opportunities to listen to uh, talks uh, given either by uh, Elena uh, Reichlova, by Rafael Siger, or by uh, uh, Libor Smeshkal, and they will give all the details about this study. Or you can uh, have a look at these, uh, this paper and at this other paper on archive about the, the, the theory of uh, um, the spin symmetry uh, groups. So with this, uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of the uh, local uh, collaborators, all of the uh, national collaborators, and all of the uh, international collaborators. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a great talk. We will have a class for you. Um, so let's begin. I think, uh, I think, Alison, let me uh, promote to um, a lot of talk. So um, let's see. Uh, Avishek, you had a, a question? And then uh, Igor and Arnav afterwards. Can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Or did you have a question? So clear. But, uh, OK, let me go to Igor then. Um, Igor, uh, can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Yeah. Well, uh, I wonder if, if you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Go yes. Ahead. Okay. Uh, all these experiments uh, contain the interface, and it's very important to understand uh, to what extent this interface is clear uh, if there is some diffusion between these layers, which uh, changes uh, and uh, electron scattering and uh, contribution of spin orbit coupling and so on. So, and probably for different materials, you have uh, different quality also. Could you comment on this? Yes, so uh, I, I agree with you uh, that the uh, interface must be considered with uh, the, the highest care. Um, and that's why uh, we pay a lot of attention to varying the interfaces and to try to see how this uh, matters. So, for example, when we looked at the uh, um, linear fluctuations in relation to the uh, um, um, to the uh, um, uh, nail temperature, uh, we paid a lot of attention by uh, to, to change the interface. So, for example, we've used a direct coupling between the nickel ion layer and the iridium manganese layer, or we've added also a copper layer. And at the end of the day, for this type of study, uh, it probably, it surely affects the amplitude 
of uh, the uh, absorption because the, the, the spin angular momentum is not transferred in the same way, uh, but it does not uh, impact, uh, for example, the position of the peak. Uh, so there, there, there are some, some stuff that are not impacted, but sure the, the uh, amplitudes of, uh, of, of these effects are impacted. Um, what I can say also from the study that, uh, that I've shown today is that, for example, uh, when we studied the, the self-induced spin charge conversion in the nickel ion layer, uh, what was very surprising to us is that these effects were there. Um, and we wanted to make sure that it was not related to any type of uh, interface related like rash bar or, or whichever type of effect. So we paid a lot of attention to make sure that this effect was still there when we add, uh, for example, uh, when we sandwiched our nickel ion between two MGO layers, between two copper layers, between two alumina layers, and then we, we made the mix of all this. And we could conclude at the end of the day that yes, the amplitude of the effect is not the same because the pumping is probably not the same. I mean, the, 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 the asymmetry in the, in the interface scattering is not the same, but the effect is always there and the position of the effect is also always there. Okay. Well, uh, uh, let me ask a little bit. Um, Actually, let, let's, let's move on to the other version and then maybe I come back to you. Is that okay? Okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. Uh, yeah. And then I'll come back to you, okay? Uh, Burkhardt, can you please go ahead and ask your question? Burkhardt, can you hear me or? Not sorry, there. sorry, I had to switch on my microphone. Uh, first of all, uh, Vincent, I find it very impressive how you imprint all these structures into the antiferromagnetic layers. Um, my question is the role of magnons, or the possible no role of magnons. I mean, uh, if you look at it in a simple way, uh, of course, the different systems which you couple have very different resonance frequencies. On the other hand, magnons can also have some evanescent kind of 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 of, uh, of amplitudes. Is there anything you are considering? I mean, you were mentioning very shortly terahertz stuff, but terahertz, of course, is non-resonant to any to any magnetic firm, um, or is it only static? And what is the implication if you would later on do a very fast sw switching? Okay, so you, I guess, if I understand it well, you refer to um, uh, to the uh, last. Uh, am I am I sharing my screen at the moment or not? Yeah, you're sharing. Oh, now you're not. But uh, if you share it again. Ah, okay. Uh, sorry. So I will share it again. It was fine. Just a second. Mm -hmm. It's fine. Okay, uh, and that is. Uh, oh. yeah, it takes a few seconds to come in. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you, you are referring to this type, for example, of um, of work. Yes. So yes. In, in this type of work, uh, I would say there are two, two different things. As you said, there is this, uh, I mean, K equals zero, where, where, where we are at, at resonance, where we can probably sort out the uh, mm -hmm. damping, for example, in the antiferromagnet. Um, uh, and uh, and we can do also some some or attempt to do some spin pumping, uh, and for example, um, uh, I'm referring to this study uh, here by which was led by by Romain uh, Lebrun mm -hmm. um, and uh, was made in the group of, of Mathias, uh, where actually the role of magnons was the, the purpose was to study the role of magnons in hematite uh, at um, above the marine transition when the hematite is in the um, uh, uh, easy plane uh, phase. Uh, and they could show that uh, when, you, um, uh, um, when you excite the system by, by a torque, by using a spin hole effect uh, uh, induced uh, torque, uh, you can propagate uh, two linear um, uh, modes which couple and which make it a circular mode, which is polarized. And after some lengths, because the dispersion of the two linear modes are not the same, they kind of unphase or deface, and you recover linear modes, which are not polarized anymore. Mm -hmm. So basically after some lengths, you can't, you can't uh, have, um, detect any, any, any spin polarization uh, or any transmission of the magnons. 
And I see this type of study, which, which uh, again, I was, I was led uh, uh, um, by, by other groups, um, is very interesting. So for this, um, there was this physics, I mean, uh, and also we needed to make sure that the damping was small, which could explain why uh, the magnons could propagate over a few micrometer uh, lengths. Um, and for some reason, damping in hematite was found to be as small as uh, damping in uh, YIG uh, ferromagnets, uh, which, which explanation is not completely clear, but, uh, but that's, well, it, it is what it, what it is. I don't know if it answers the, yeah, I was the question. For the, for the combined structures, which you are putting here, because you have really a, a, a stack of, of different layers with very different resonance frequencies. That is a different thing than transport in bulk Hematite. For for the combined, sorry, I don't I don't get the the point. I'm sorry. For the combined structure, yeah, I don't want to take too much time. Maybe, maybe, right. maybe well, you guys can maybe discuss afterwards. Yeah. It's just simply the dispersion of the of the of the, of the waves. You know, they will not be the same. It will not be much yes. much yes. because of boundary conditions. And therefore, I was asking what kind of conditions yes. magnet transport could could take. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, this con let's go over to Abhishek. Uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? I don't know if, uh, okay, maybe uh, his microphone is not working. I'll ask the question, he's written it here. Is there a way to separate, uh, to separately know the contribution of the uh, uh, ISOT and IS, uh, the uh, investment spin, spin hall effect in bare ferromagnet layer at room temperature from spin pumping studies? Um, I know the answer, but I'll let you answer. Yeah, it's possible to 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 know the contribution. Huh? The point is that symmetry. if you look at the data, uh, yeah. it's yeah, yeah, by symmetry and and and. Uh, um, but if we, if we look at the data, the the at room temperature, most of the time this contribution is quite small. Uh, where are the data? Uh, they are shown somewhere. Uh, well, somewhere here. Yeah, you look at the data close to room temperature. Uh, I mean, the, the the spin charge conversion in the nickel and iron layer is very small. And some other other papers concluded on on about one percent for the for the for the whole angle, uh, which we we didn't we we are not bold enough to uh, to 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 extract uh, this type of uh, of data because I think it's very hard to extract from from this type of data, but. I mean, yeah, it's virtually uh, one percent or zero in nickel iron at room temperature, but really cross up uh, to a huge amount in nickel iron. So in this paper, we've made some nickel and platinum, platinum, nickel iron, and and this type of stacks to know about the direction of the spin current, and at the same time we can compare the uh, amplitude of uh, the nickel iron spin charge conversion here at hundred Kelvin. Uh, compared to, to to platinum, and we find similar amplitudes. Okay, uh, let's go to Martin. Uh, Martin, can you ask a question, please? Uh, yes. First, thanks for your talk. I have a similar question to Burkhard. Maybe it's nearly the same, but I did not understand your answer. The question is on one very simple. You have a copper spacer which is really very thin. On this copper, so just a low electron spin transport, but no magnon transport. But as has already Borkart said, you have a fast decaying copper, but not as fast that nothing from this magnon or spin wave goes through this copper. There must be some additional effect. I did not understand this additional effect. Okay, okay, I got okay, I got the point now. Okay, I will come back to this uh, to this slide maybe. Yeah. Um, from. I, I agree with you, uh, uh, but uh, from our data, we um, uh, we could not draw conclusion on the additional effect. So, what if there is an additional effect? It's small, uh, and we can't disentangle it from the uh, uh, effect due to I mean purely to the the electronic transport. Uh, and, and yeah, and f well, that's I mean in, in the metallic stacks we can't see we can't see it, and in, in this 
uh, when we are working with this uh, insulator here, yes, there is probably uh, also something we, uh, it was slightly pointed out, I mean, uh, at the beginning of, of, the, of the questions, uh, we are not entirely sure as to how efficient this interface, this copper nickel iron oxide interface will be in terms of, uh, of transmitting angular momentum. Okay. So that there is the, the, the purely uh, effect in copper, but there are also uh, I mean, this interface because copper might also well oxidize a little bit and that might change the whole, the whole story. Yeah, I would expect that would also influence the electronic transport equally, but it uh, seems not to be the case, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sorry, so Revas, uh, can you maybe ask a question now? Uh, yes, Th thank you for the inspiring talk. Uh, I would like just to, uh, to make a brief comment regarding the very last part of, of the talk where you mentioned uh, the experimental work by Reichlova et al. and by, uh, by Jairo Libor and, and uh, Thomas Jungwirth. Uh, there is also another effect uh, which, is, which expresses itself very similarly to the one that you showed. Uh, and that's that hinges on applied magnetic field. Uh, the difference being that the, the spontaneous splitting that you mentioned uh, can be described as uh, something of the order of exchange splitting times a function of momentum that, that goes from zero to a, to a value of the order of unity. Uh, whereas uh, the magnetic field effect has the form of, you know, it, it's proportional to the magnetic field times also a function of momentum that goes from zero to something of the order of unity. And while, of course, you know, in the, in the low field limit, uh, in, in, in the limit of the vanishing field, this, this, this effect vanishes. Nevertheless, the field can go up to the same order of magnitude of the exchange splitting or the exchange gap. And because that's, uh, that's the, the value where antiferromagnetism tends to collapse. So, uh, and, and of course the magnetic field effect is, is tunable rather easily. Uh, while, well, of course, you know, if, if, if your spontaneous splitting of the order is of the order of 300 Tesla, such magnetic fields are not readily available. But other than that, I would say fundamentally, there is, there is much similarity. Um, okay. Okay. Well, one quick thing I make a comment to you, Vesta, that is actually not true exactly what you said. It turns out that. The, uh, this is splitting, this exact splitting is actually proportional to the field uh, splitting of the material. And this has to do with symmetries. We go a little more into that paper of the outer magnets where we show that these hints of this new type of mechanism are not really that, uh, that a third of the magnetic classes uh, can actually exhibit it. So uh, in that sense, I think is, uh, and in this case, you actually have uh, the spin transport that uh, with the spin conserving effects, which I think are very, very different and unique. Yeah, yeah but uh, sorry, I, I, I missed the point. Uh, I, I thought, you know, for instance, when Libor spoke earlier and when you commented in, yeah. in, in some other talks, you would always say that, look, there is a splitting of the order of the yeah, and that's what we thought. That's what we thought, but this is not the case. Uh, if you actually see now the latest, I mean, this is all recent things, how that is just uh, uh, when we're, this is uh, the new classes there, we define a new type of, well, this is not this talk, so there's not too much into that. We will try to schedule a talk on this outer magnets that we predicted. But but what, what's uh, the scale then? Uh, it typically, well, it varies quite a bit because it does probably now, the, the actual stagger splitting, the scale you're gonna find to be uh, the field splitting um, on the, um, the crystal field splitting in your systems. 
So it's a crystal field, which is not too different actually sometimes from the exchange, but it's actually the crystal field uh, that seems to be the origin of it uh, that connects. So we can go much, but let's, 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 let's delay it maybe to the, when we give a talk on the theory then, uh, or in the meantime, mm. you're welcome to read the, the figure that we have on the archives and comment on it. Uh, mm. okay. Well, what I may add also on this uh, on this paper is that uh, I mean at least data really points to the uh, the importance of the of the well the crystallography and, and probably the spin symmetry group. Uh, uh, the, with manganese five silicon three, there are some transitions, and for example, in bulk, if the material is not strained. You have um, an, an hexagonal to orthorhombic transition, and uh, in the orthorhombic case, you, um, you 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 lower the symmetry, and if you uh, uh, if you lower the symmetry, you don't have uh, it's, it's not possible to observe this uh, this large hole effect. It's re re what we think is that it's really because the uh, samples are strained because they are epitaxial and thin that we don't have this symmetry lowering. So it, Experimental data really also points to the importance of um, of symmetry. Uh, yeah, so right. symmetry is is very important. But may, maybe I shall send you a few references. Uh, right. Yeah. And, and then yeah. You, you will be able to see for yourself. Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. Uh, Arnab, thank you. Uh, you have a question, Arnab, uh, I believe. Uh, can you unmute yourself? Uh, Hello. Uh, yeah. Thanks for this okay. nice talk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is, if uh, if it is in multi-domain state, uh, how does it affect for anomalous Hall effect? I'm talking about manis 5 silicon 3. That's a question we are trying to answer uh, as we speak also. <laughs> Uh, for example, the exact uh, the exact magnetic configuration of the um, of the manganese five silicon three, and whether it's possible to put it in a multi-domain state, whether in a multi-domain state you 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 have a half of it that responds positively, the other half negatively. I mean that that's some of the questions that are still open, and that's some of the challenges we we are we are we are trying to 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 face at the moment. So I don't have the answer. So yeah, I believe. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I believe uh, this uh, a collinear antiferromagnet, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. So in that uh, big macron size device, would not it be uh, multi-domain in uh, naturally? Not obviously. No, no, no. There's no. Why? Why would it be so? Uh, okay. uh, uh, I'm not sure. Just as uh, I'm asking, because uh, maybe two different domains uh, will have uh, equal preference to be formed during the growth growth process. Yeah, not At least the, the, the these type of data seem to say that uh, that at some point it's saturated. Uh, and remanence point to um, I mean something that's saturated. It's possible to do minor hysteresis loops and 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 possibly conclude that with minor hysteresis loops, it's possible to put it in domains with a mechanism that we don't understand so far. Uh, but data seem to say that they are probably naturally uh, saturated. Maybe there are some some strain effects which we don't master at the moment and which favor one domain versus the other one. No. Okay, uh, one last question. Uh, actually, I'm very curious in it. Uh, uh, does it have a little bit of magnetism, just like magnetic 13, or it should be completely uh, compensated? The experiments uh, point to uh, a, a non measurable magnetization. That's what I can say. So whether it's strictly zero or uh, tiny below 10 to the minus seven, 10 to the minus eight EMU per centimeter cube is uh, anything between zero and the limit of, of, uh, of, of the squid. The important thing is that the origin of it will not be linear in that weak magnetization. That no. in the limit of zero magnetization, the still the fact will be there. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Okay, exactly. Yeah. And uh, Igor, did you wanted to follow up on the question that uh, you had? Uh, 
Yes, uh, it's uh, just continuation of this question about interfaces. Uh, to what extent these interfaces are stable uh, with respect to uh, heating? And uh, if you repeat uh, the same experiment on the same, same sample after some time, after heating and decreasing temperature and so on, is it the same or not? Uh, after some time, it is the same, for sure. The data are, are completely uh, reproducible. Uh, after heating, to be honest, I don't remember if we've done the experiments. So I wouldn't want to say anything wrong. Uh, I don't think we've done this type of experiments. Uh, but after some time, it's reproducible, and from sample to sample, it's it's highly reproducible. Mm -hmm. Because you understand, for any uh, any device, uh, you need uh, to say uh, how many circles it survives. Yeah, sure, sure, okay, yeah, sure. But okay. we're, we're we are not at that at that level yet. <laughs> yeah, we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, but. Uh, for theoreticians, it's important. Is it, it becomes older if there is diff, diffusion or not, how to calculate what, is, what happens. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and with that, I think we concluded uh, the questions. I don't, Risa, I lower your hand, but I don't know if you had a further question or not. Uh, uh, I don't see it. So for now, I'll. Um, I'll, uh, thank you very much, Vincent, for a very uh, wonderful talk, as always, and uh, very engaging uh, discussions. I hope you enjoyed the 150 yeah, people that did show up. I mean, right now they triggered now to less, but there was 150 together with uh, Zoom and, uh, and the YouTube, uh, and about 30 countries uh, have been online. Uh, so um, I hope you guys join us next week uh, for one more. And then, just as I mentioned, uh, in the July, we'll have a couple uh, more talks uh, before we take a break. And we'll take a break in August uh, after that. Uh, and uh, thank you once again, everybody. Okay. And, uh, we'll see you yeah. next week.